What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Black Belt Business Podcast. I'm your host, Elliot Marshall, and it is my goal with each episode of this podcast to share the stories, strategies, tactics, tools, and resources that will help you establish or grow your martial arts school. The Black Belt Business Podcast is brought to you by Easton Online. You can find all of our digital courses, martial arts curriculums, and resources designed to help you enhance your business at easton.online. So without further ado, let's jump into the episode. Eastern Online Podcast, back in a new way. What's up, fellas? What's up, Elliot? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm feeling good today. Good. We, uh, we're doing something new. We're doing something different. We're going to do just us for a while. As in <clears throat> our staff, Eastern staff, the three of us, and then uh, another one with Mike and Ian, you know, the... The two uh, top dogs, kind of, of the company. So, uh, uh, us lowly dogs. <laughs> this is where I am too these days. <laughs> and then we'll also go Mike and Ian, who are all the way up at the top of the organization. And we'll just talk about the business and how we see it and how we do it. A little bit of Easton Online, and we'll just go from there. Is that, uh, I know it sounds good to you guys because we already talked about this in our meetings. <laughs> so <laughs> We're not going to disagree now. Yeah, we're not going to disagree now. So... Uh, let's get to it, okay? First of all, <coughs> uh, let's just talk about meetings and the importance of them. And you guys run a lot of meetings with lower level staff, right? Like so that we, so that you can get that staff on the same page uh, for the school and then all the schools together. And I think. I'll just say, even with upper level staff, when Mike and Ian and Amal and I used to start having meetings, it was such a shit show. We would sit in the room, uh, 50% of the time, Mike and Amal would argue, and then the other 50% of the time, we got nothing done other than writing some numbers on the board. What has meetings, first of all, have you guys ever known Easton without meetings? No. Yes, okay. but only briefly. Okay, and Phipps? No, when I started, we were doing meetings we twice, do- twice a month. Twice a month. Mm-hmm. Department meetings, what kind of meetings did you start with, Phipps? Department meetings. Department meetings. And Jordan, briefly, you said for you. Well, for us, like you'll remember when you were doing those, those monthly instructor trainings, mm. like back in Boulder, mm-hmm. right? Like that was a meeting without infrastructure. Yes. Right? That was just you bringing all of the instructors in Boulder in one place and talking to us about what a skillful class was or how we needed to be. So those, those were the precursors to the first department meetings. Right. And I remember when that was happening, we got going and then Mike put a stop to it because we were getting ready to roll out the new company meeting structure. Right. So right around the time that I started working with Easton and coaching for Easton, we were on the cusp of transitioning to a, a formally structured meeting process. Okay. And you opened, you guys, Jordan, you're the GM of Longmont. Mm -hmm. Phipps, you're the DH at Longmont. Mm -hmm. And we opened that school a month before the pandemic. Two months. Exactly two months before we closed. So January 20th. January January 13th. 13th, Yeah. We opened and we hung that sign on the door March 13th. And it was a Friday. Right. Yeah. It was Friday the 13th. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was prophetic. (laughs) Oh yeah. It was Friday the 13th. I remember. Um, I drank a lot that night. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, so reasonable, reasonable, reasonable. Uh, what do you think, how do you structure your meetings first of all? Right. And then what do you think they give? Mm. Can I talk about this? And then you jump in. So, like looking at this from the top down. So as a general manager, we have a weekly meeting with all of the general managers. Okay. So all seven of the schools, all the GMs, we meet once a week for 90 minutes. And that's valuable. That's valuable. So if anybody has multiple schools, making sure that the leaders of the schools, the general managers can meet, commiserate, if for no other reason than to commiserate about what's going on. That's really important, having that sounding board. Uh, But also just 
sharing best practices, sharing knowledge back and forth. GM meetings important. So now we can go down to the school level, yeah. right? So each department, the structure that we've ultimately settled on, and we've tried a lot of different cadence and rhythms and frequencies, so on and so forth. The structure that we've settled on is now we have a monthly department meeting for each department. So like Phipps, he runs the monthly Muay Thai meeting. There's a monthly kids department meeting, which includes right now includes jujitsu and kids Muay Thai. But as the kids Muay Thai program grows, those will probably be separate. And then there's a monthly jujitsu coaches meeting. And then I also have a weekly admin meeting. That's the one department at the school where we meet weekly every Monday morning for about 45 minutes. Okay, tell me your admin. What does admin mean? So admin means basically all of the front desk people. Okay, so right? like the front desk meeting. Front desk meeting. Okay. Yeah, and I just call it an admin meeting. Um, and the reason we have that weekly is because that is one area of the school where there's so much going on week to week. And we need to check in on numbers. We need to check in on close ratios, cancellations, suspensions, see if we can spot trends, look at attendance, what's going on. So it's really the one meeting a week where we're really diving into the, the backbone <clears throat> of the processes that run the academy and making sure everything's going well. And there's so many updates. I mean, like every month we get, might have a different promotion going on or we got a, this fitness challenge or we got to pick a winner here. This person needs a prize or stuff like that let's let's bring this back a little bit to an eastern online person now like, okay like, like our mem our clients uh -huh. and what it looked like for them when they started because we're talking about meetings here right and we're talking about departments and you're talking and, and like admin meetings and number and right like close ratios yeah holy fuck that's not where you start that's not where you start okay no. that is not where you start so this is a really good um way for us to segue back let's just stick in this admin area sure i'm sure you've been part of these meetings too probably phipps right because you're a major player in the school um i can remember when when easton started tracking numbers yes right and what does that even mean this 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 is probably if you're going to do anything right if you're going to do anything with your school um get a crm use it and track your signups, right? Track how many leads come in, how many of those leads actually show up, how many of those shows turn into appointments, right? And how many of those appointments turn into sales, right? Like this is such a major thing that I would say most of our clients are like, oh my God, really? Tracking numbers. What, are, you're shaking your head a lot here, Jordan. Yeah, no, it's just, it's interesting because I have a friend and she worked at our front desk for a long time, for about a year. Okay. She was a rock star. She's in New York right now. Toddy. Yeah. 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 I didn't know if we could name yeah, names, but anyway, whatever. yeah. So Toddy's on her artist's New York pilgrimage right now. Okay. She's awesome. But she got some jobs with some local schools up in New York and she was sharing her experience, like contrasting the experience between what we would do and what she was encountering. And for sure, it sounded like all the horror stories that you used to tell me when we were shooting our first course. And I was like, I've never seen anybody do this, but I'm going to believe that you're right. But then she started telling me, like they don't have a CRM. All the waivers are in a filing cabinet. They've got to manually fill out waivers. <laughs> the guy, the head of the academy had no idea how many current members he had. Right. All he cared about was how many new members he was signing up each month. So he was tracking something, but it was just all about sign them up, sign them up, sign them up. He had no idea how many people were leaving. He had no idea his retention, cancellations, nothing. It was just, there was no system. It right. was all on paper. So he probably couldn't track it. He was just like, well, if I can just keep signing people up, then we're good. Then we're good. Right. And I don't know, that might. You might survive, but I don't think you're going to thrive that way. Phipps, you came from another school. Mm -hmm. uh, what was, uh, what was, that's going to fall. That's going to fall. All right. Phipps says no. <laughs> don't worry Phipps about says it. no. <laughs> don't worry uh, about it. What was that, what was that school like? Did you, what was it like compared to Easton? Just as far as that side of things for you, from what you could see. For sure. Um, 
Uh, I would think that like where I came from is similar to what Toddy was experiencing um, and, and maybe even to a lesser degree because uh, the person who ran that school, it was not like the thing that he was worried about it was like growing the school. He had a really good job. He made good money. Um, and so for him, he just wanted a place to teach jujitsu and to get training partners, to, to build training partners. And so there was no emphasis on the back end as far as building numbers, um, crafting experience. And it it's a great school um, to train at and like right. you, you feel close to everyone, but it's not the same focus on the business aspect. And I, I can almost guarantee um, the numbers aren't being tracked and, and like used to inform decisions moving forward. Right. We're, we're not worried about like uh, the retention rates in this month and, and that changing our approach because there's no approach to it. Right. Can I add something? <clears throat> yeah, of course. This is Whoa, we just why get, Phipps we was... We just need to buy another microphone. Yeah, we need another microphone. It's all right. We'll get three for the next one. Um, you know, I, I think of that phrase, what gets measured gets managed. Right. And I think about myself in the academy and how many times I realize how hard it is to see the water you're swimming in. Like you might live in your academy day in, day out, and you might think you have your thumb on the pulse. And that's very important. Like you can't just keep your thumb on the pulse of your school by looking at the numbers, but you can't keep your thumb on the pulse either by just being there, right? Because it's very subjective when you're in the academy and the numbers give you an elevated perspective, like an objective look at what's going on. Like there's a lot of times I'm like, whoa, we just had record attendance or I think we're busy. And then I look at our attendance and I'm like, no, we were just busy in this time slot. Overall, there was a drop. What's going on? We're not, numbers never lie. Right. Numbers never lie. Like they, they just, they tell the truth, mm -hmm. you know? So if you feel busy, but then when you look at the numbers, it goes, oh God, maybe everyone's coming to one class. Right. So in that one class that you teach at 6 p.m. on Monday through Thursday, it's slammed. And then every other class is dead. Right? Exactly. But it feels good. Right. It feels good, but the numbers don't lie. It feels like you're signing a lot of people up, okay? Which you might be. And this is something that people in this <clears throat> and why we track. Literally, let's go over the, the categories we track again for our front desk. And at, tell me if, if I'm missing anything. We track the total number of leads coming in, mm -hmm. right? And then we want those leads to turn into appointments set. Yes. So we track that stage and people ask, and, and like when I sit down and I talk to people on the phone, they ask me a lot. Like, yeah, they, they say, yeah, we track. I had a hundred leads and I had 50 signups and they think that's good. And technically that is good, but you don't know the minutia in between, right? Right. You could be doing better. Your funnel may be breaking down at a specific point. point. Like they're not understanding that the funnel isn't just lead to sign up. It's lead to appointment, to orientation. Patient. To close right and so, then keeping them and then that's so that's the four stages yeah of, right. of, of the funnel right the the retention is another piece that we'll talk about another sure. time right but uh and sure 100 to 50 is real is good right like we, we would be fine with that like with a client having that but if you're getting 100 leads and you're getting 90 appointments and 90 of them to show and only 50 of them closing. Your close, your, your show to close is terrible. What do we like our show to close to be? I think we're aiming for, I want to say drops, right? At yeah. Least. So I think like we're aiming to set 80% of the leads we get and then we want 80% of those so to show up and then we want 80% of them to sign up. So right. I think ultimately... Like closed is, is 40. Yep. It's that's 40, what I was about to say. It's 40%. 20. But, right. if, but one of the things that we do when we see that, like in the scenario that I just said, mm -hmm. 90 people showing up, 50 closing, that's not 80%. Right. We'll, we'll go, okay, no, the funnel's not good. Mm -hmm. The funnel's not good. We need to train this area right now. We need to train our sales are off. Right. Right. Our sale is wrong. Or if, reverse that if we have a hundred leads and 60 uh 60 appointments set we're setting we're either setting terrible appointments or we're getting really really bad leads and this right. is something that you always have to be tracking this is why we track each stage i agree this was something i ran into i want to say several months ago where i noticed like we were getting leads but our appointment set like weren't 
where we wanted them to be. And I had to look into it and I realized really what it is was us becoming more skillful in our response time to the leads. Right. You know, like I think we aim at Easton to respond to an incoming lead that comes in during business hours within the hour. Right. Because that's a hot lead. If you're on the website, you fill out a form and within the hour you're getting a text message, you're going to respond. But if you don't get a text message to the next day, who knows what went through your brain in those 24 hours? You could have already picked out a different school. You could have decided, nah, never mind. I'm going to do karate instead of jujitsu. You could have that joined a gym. Could have like back to you. Exactly, exactly. If the other school got back to you first, you know, mm -hmm. there was something I heard at a at a conference earlier this year. If you don't differentiate yourself, people are going to go to who's closer and who's cheaper. And I think one of the ways that every school can differentiate themselves, because I don't think the bar is very high, is their response time. Like if you can respond quicker than everybody else, you are going to appear as a more professional and premium valuable product than your competition. Yeah, that's 100%, right? <clears throat> and, and, and this is the low hanging fruit. It's difficult with the systems, mm -hmm. right? It's difficult getting it set up, but it is pretty low hanging fruit to respond quickly, right? It is, you know, and that's one of the things. Um, Phipps, for you with this, uh, <clears throat> when this person comes into the school now, right? What is that? Because you don't deal much with the front desk, right? Mm -hmm. You're a teacher. Correct. Right? You're a teacher. And one of the things that you hear all the time is that uh, if you grow big enough, it gets watered down. Right? Like, mm -hmm. it gets watered down. So mm -hmm. I know I'm switching topics here a little bit. But for you from the front lines, how do you ensure that we don't water down the product? Well, part of it is selection and then training. Like, it's not anybody who can be a coach. We do keep that process, like, open. I want that to be something that everyone who walks in and spends time with us can strive for. But... In the end, not everyone's going to reach that level. And when you do decide you're going to, you're going to go for that and like you're the type of person we're looking for, there's a lot of training that goes into it. So by the time you are finally a kickboxing coach, right, which is our entry level, you haven't ever thrown a punch in your life, you're going to kickboxing class and you're going to learn to throw punches. By the time you meet that person who's a first day student and they've never thrown a punch in their life, you are going to be able to teach them to punch really well. You're going to be able to teach them to kick and knee and everything they need to know to then move on to the next level really well. So it starts with selection. It then goes to training. And then when we're talking about these meetings, like these meetings are so important as well as the numbers to keeping track of all this, right? Um, we talk about, okay, if we've set this many appointments, but we're not selling as many as we should be, we can point to the sales process and say, that's a problem, right? But the fact of the matter is every new lead that comes in, they're going to spend more time with a coach than they are the person who they met at the front desk, right? That coach is going to be the person who leaves that the impression. That class is about to be real. That, that first class is so important. So important. The connection you make with the coach, um, how good the class was, sweating, smiling, learning, right? That experience has to happen every single time. So we use those meetings to shape everything, to make sure that the product, the, um, the presentation, it's as skillful as it can be. Um, and we use those meetings to train skills as well. Not just like, how do you be a good coach? How to make a great first class, how to build rapport, but how do we teach this technique? Okay. Everyone go in the room, goes around, shows how we're going to show the technique. And then we all critique it. And, and we start working towards something that's an even better product than any of us would have put out on our own. It's a team effort. The meetings are important. The training's important and the right people are important as well. How did y'all do this during COVID? Cause like you had no rapport built, right? Like, mm -hmm. like these meetings, like you're hiring people, like you two got it, you know, cause you love Easton and you started, uh, uh, filming with, mm -hmm. you know, like you really came on at that point. Uh, it was really cool. Easton online, how it really helped Easton mm -hmm. it, during that time. Yeah. Right. Like, I wonder what would have happened if we didn't start this, like that would have been a, a massive headache getting, yep video information out you're like you're smiling jordan you know I, I wonder like i know i divulged diverged there what are you what are you smiling about i think just what i was smiling about was um you know we already had the infrastructure and the platform and the system yeah. was there and it 
we never envisioned it being used as a student facing thing for us but yeah when we found this need to create all this student facing content to keep all of our members engaged as much as we could it was like oh well here's the backbone here's the highway it's already built let's just put a car on it right so we'll it, we would know. have had to have built the infrastructure had we not had it or we had would have had to rely on like youtube or right. something like that we'll never know how many students it saved mm -mm. right we'll, we'll never know right but it was an interesting thing that we could just put it up yeah and it could just live there forever Right. Yeah. And 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 then you could we we video oh, Zoom classes right in that room right over there not not the secret room but on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that I was teaching Zoom yeah. classes every fucking night. I, I hope I never do it again. Um, <laughs> but and, and they probably still live somewhere. You know. Yeah, I think you know? they are around yeah. there somewhere. They're around somewhere. When but. you say watered down, because I know that for better or for worse, like this has been on the forefront of some people's minds. Lately. Oh, it's, and it's massive on mine. Right. Now, when, when people say watered down, can we unpack that a little bit? Yeah. Like what specifically, like what Phipps said was great, but what do they mean? What's, what's happening when they say watered down? Cause that can mean a lot of different things. Like I could imagine it's like, Oh, everybody here isn't as tough because we're trying to appeal to the masses. Yeah, that's, you that's know, it I, I, it's that's, that, it's, it's that. not like the, the martial skill. It's not like the quality of the instruction yeah, the, or thing. It's both. It's all those it's things. It's all those things. So it's just, a culture in general being watered down. I've been teaching martial arts since I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. oh, right? So when you come to my, and I'm just using me as the example. Yeah. So when you come to my class, you're probably going to get a very skilled class. John mm -hmm. Donahar, I'm not. Okay? I have a family. You know? So. <laughs> well, it's skillful in different ways, right? Right. But, but it's skillful in different ways. Yes. You know? Uh, but you know, uh, it, the whole karate argument, like karate sold out, mm -hmm. right? Karate sold out in the sense of that's the argument is they, they went for money, you know, like a lot of karate schools went for money. Mm -hmm. And do I think it's eventually going to happen for jujitsu? Probably, you know, I mm -hmm. think it's probably already happening. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent it? Like that, that's, that's what I mean by watered down. Like yeah. we're going to look, I live a good life, right? I live a really yeah. comfortable life and the, and now Mike does and now Ian does. So we've gone from me and them all as the owners to even one more layer down that, mm -hmm. has, that make, that lives a very comfortable life. The next goal is one more layer down, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, uh, if you've been paying attention, we'll get there, mm -hmm. right? Like we'll definitely get there. The GM level, sure, you know, and then the DH level. Like what? I don't know about the DH. Can't you? like that's still too low of a position. I think to be like super comfortable. But mm -hmm. uh, you're hold on. I should we should divulge. Phipps is not just a DH. He is the <laughs> what? What? You're the director of marketing. Have you? Yes. No. Are we there yet? He's the director of digital. Media. The director of digital media. Okay. Yeah, so, but he's he's also the director of marketing. We okay. just. He doesn't yeah. officially have the title. He hasn't been anointed. Okay. It'll happen one Mike, day. Won't, Mike won't let that go yet. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Does he listen to this? No. He we'll will. find out. He will. We'll, we'll find, find out. out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, so if you've been paying attention, you've seen like. And it takes time, obviously. Mm -hmm. But that's the watered down that I'm talking about. You guys are just going to try to get people paid. Make yeah. money. Yeah. And sure, we make fucking money. I'm not going to say we don't make money. Uh, you look like you want to answer that. Yeah, go. Yeah, I want yeah. to. I have something to say. Too, I understand where this idea would come from. How can you have this many members or this many students and not water down a product? But we still have people quit and leave our academies all the time because there's la I don't want to say they're lacking toughness, but classes are too tough. They're getting beat up. Um, we do more to take care of people, but this is, it's not like everyone walks into the academy and, and stays for 10 years and gets their black belt. Like we're not handing them out and it's, it's still a tough sport. Every single time you walk into our classes, if you're going to be there for Randori, you're going to have some tough roles. You're going to be tired. You're going to be sore afterwards. So I think that one thing that 
happens is people see the amount of students we have and they assume it, we can't have that many students and still be teaching good martial arts because we've watered down the product. But I would say what is happening um, more realistically is people are making it tougher than I would say it has to be. You're, you're carrying this idea of toughness into your academy, which is built on just a whole history of, of uh, ideas that don't necessarily equate to actual toughness. And you're saying, this is the line in the sand. And if you can't deal with you know our level of toughness, um, then you, this just isn't for you. Uh, I would say that if you put our blue belts against other schools, blue belts, even when they're quote unquote tough schools, we'll do fine. We'll do fine. We might not win every match. We're going to do fine. And it's the same all the way up. So we're creating strong martial artists, but we're also doing it in a way that's a little bit more focused on the experience of the students outside of just toughness, outside of just building toughness. Yeah, no, I, I think I was going to, I think I'll expand on that on basically what you just said. Like I think about the different extremes that jujitsu schools can go. And I don't think there's one correct way to do it. Like I think about Daisy fresh and I've only watched like one of those episodes online. I'm pretty detached from the internet, but you know, I see like this, I see these videos on flow grappling of these schools where it's just, it's 120 degrees in there. They're in an old laundry mat. And I mean, it's just a bunch of world champion level killers murdering each other day in, day out. That school's not going to get very big, right? Can't. No, it yeah. can't. It's not going to be. And so <laughs> I think first and foremost, it's like when you say watered down, well, like I, you could, I think there's an argument to be made that that school is watered down. Because they're, only, because they're only focusing on one variable that I think that is important to grow a good culture. But they may not want that. They may have a different kind of culture. Let me, let me back up for a little bit. And you're not hating bit. on that. No, I'm not hating yeah, yeah, on yeah. that. It's just a choice, right. right? But where I think Easton chooses differently from some other schools is, and I think this quote is attributed to Amal. I'm hearing it you know, secondhand. Is you can raise just as many lions on a farm as you can sheep. Right? Like when Phipps and I train together, we know what's happening. You know, and I've heard you talk about this before. Like I train much differently with Phipps than I do a uh, 120 pound female. Right? But I also think that, you know, I remember during the pandemic when we were all limited to like a handful of training partners. Right? right? And I remember the first couple of sessions with those training partners where we were just trying to kill each other every round. It got real old real fucking quick. Like it sucked. There was no fun in it. I was like, man, this is, if I, if I have to do this every time when I can only train two days a week with these four people, this is really going to blow. And that really opened up my mind to realizing that, man, if you want to grow some flowers, you got to play in the mud and you got to be willing to make some mistakes, right? You got to keep it playful. You got to keep that learning curve steep. So I think there's a variable to becoming skilled at jujitsu where you have to be willing to keep it playful and get beat up. And I think that type of rolling, which we encourage in Longmont a lot and Easton encourages <clears throat> a lot, really fosters skill development and you develop a lot of high level technical individuals. Now I won't speak for everybody else, but I will say this. When we started the Longmont Academy, I remember our first Randori, right? And I'm still a purple belt, but I remember standing in the line it was me at the top of the line, and then there were six two-stripe white belts, <laughs> right? Like, that was it. That was our right. Randori, right. right? And I went on a feeding frenzy. Like, it was beyond out of line. Like, I was beating the crap out of all of them, right? And then I realized, man, I need to keep it playful. I need to let them beat me up. I need to work on new moves. And there is something to be said. When you're training in a room full of beginners, you can pretty much do what you want and you can work on a lot of new skills, right? And I think that's an important part of the equation is you need to have a type of training where you're fostering skill development and building people up and building yourselves up. But for a long time, that's all our academy was, was a lot of beginners. There weren't a lot of higher belts. You know, I've always had Phipps and some of the other more experienced coaches to challenge me in iron sharpens iron and help me grow. But especially over the last year, I realized as I was going out and competing that I was missing 
part of the equation. Like I wasn't training enough with people who could beat the shit out of me, you know, like make me feel we've all felt it. You like, were getting training with people worse than you and on your level. Yeah. Like you guys, right. One of you might be better. I don't know who is, but it's still on the level. Right. I think he's better, right. but, but he's either, more talented either way, it's still on the level. Right. Yeah, it's, right. It's within exactly. A, that, that you're both disagreeing, right? When we say, Elliot, of the three of us, who's better? We're not arguing this, right? Like, I'm better. Yeah. You know? So, <coughs> the, right? That would so be the, a different that, podcast. That, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, you, what, we're, and when that's what we mean by you're missing one of the steps. Yeah. You weren't getting the, oh, I need to go train with the black belts. Right. I think it takes three people to be the best you can be. You need somebody that you can beat up slash teach. Mm -hmm. You need somebody that's going to challenge you. That's your sharpening stone. And you need somebody that can teach you slash beat, beat you, you up. up. Right. And I think if you want to have the <clears throat> most successful jujitsu culture, the most successful jujitsu academy that you have, you need all of those ingredients. You need all of those people, right? And if you can build that kind of farm with those kind of lions and those kind of sheep, and this isn't, when we use the word sheep, it's just for lack of a better skillful no, more term, right? right? It's, yeah, yeah. We're not saying that they're sheeple or something like that. Right. Let's not go down there. But I think that if you can focus on that and if you can focus on what the group can accomplish together versus an individual, right? Like, um, I think that when you can get everybody rowing in the same direction, when they all understand what the culture is supposed to be, you know, I always want our students, we always want our students to be able to train with everybody. Mm -hmm. I want the black belt world champion, savage killer to be able to train with the new 50 year old 120 pound female or 120 pound male right. doesn't have to be female. Right. Right. Uh, to and can train with everybody skillfully and knows how they need to train with each person. And that like when you imagine an Academy that can do that, the potential that they can reach that rising tide, they're going to be able to leap into some championship efforts to, to groundbreaking efforts. I think that's where you're going to produce a lot of quality athletes. And so I think what the individual needs is not that much different than what the academy needs on a macro scale. I will add to, we, we do create environments that if you want to go in there and you want to go blood and guts, like those exist yeah. as well at Easton, you know, um, on the Muay Thai side, we have competition teams. So you do have to earn the trust of the coaches and the teammates and earn your way into that spot. But once you're there, like we go in on Saturdays and we try to kill each other. Like we try to kill each other. I know we have the competition team on jujitsu as well, competition practice. Right. And that's probably unlike any other practice that anybody goes to. So, yeah, I mean, I'm very, you know, I run three of them now. I'm very specific with them. Like, there's no, uh, there's no complaining to the GM or the, or the leader. Like, if, if you, what my, my phrase is with the competition drinks, if you need to complain about how I'm acting or how this class is being run or what's being, then you also need to call the police because it's a, it, I should be arrested, right? <laughs> like, you know, because I'm, I'm doing something that wrong. I might be an asshole. I might be very difficult. I might make you cry. We might scream and yell at you, right? You, you, like that is what happens in the molding of a champion or someone who's trying to be a champion. So um, I, I think you can have we, you can have all of it, right? But I think the important thing is that those people need to be able to train with everybody. Still, mm -hmm. they need to know where they're at. Mm -hmm. You know, they need to know, and and sometimes they need to be reminded. I remember it was a couple of years ago. Um, in Denver, I did something different. Like the last 10 minutes of class, I, uh, I, I did a, a up, down, out, attack the back, like EBI style, mm -hmm. you know, just to get practice at escaping back or, and attacking back when you're tired. And I put half the room down relatively, right? And then I said, <coughs> the other half the room on the wall, all right, go get them. And there were some ladies down. And all of the dudes, to a T, didn't because there was seven minutes left. They wanted one more. They none of them went with. I was so mad. I think it was ten minutes left. I ended the class. I ended the class. I brought everybody in. I was like, y'all must be. You must have lost your fucking mind. I was like, <laughs> and I was like, 
And I'll start with this. Do you know how easy I go with you guys? Like, are you aware? Like you, you and, and not, not that I'm that great, but I'm a former UFC fighter with jiu-jitsu championships. Like real, real, a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I make our role fun. Like I can just murder you over and over. This would be awful. We would, nobody would have fun. I wouldn't have fun. I'd be fucking bored too. I love rolling with you actually because yeah. you're very good at that. Yeah. But you find a level, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that is something that you, as an as a instructor, you have to constantly be checking. It's not like we have this figured out at Easton and then it just is like, oh yeah, well now you don't have to pay attention to it. And I think um, pulling it back to meetings and talking and, and a lot of communication, uh, that's how we do it, right? Like mm-hmm. we, are, we are able to check ourselves which I think is just a lot of how, how this episode started, right? With, I asked about meetings and you know, we went mm-hmm. where we went with it. But that's how we check ourselves to make sure that we're staying on the path. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask one more question about this watered down thing. Okay, go. Yeah. Is another argument for how a school or multiple schools under the same umbrella might be watered down is that they're all following the same curriculum. No, no world champions. So curriculum doesn't have anything to do with it? No. Well, yeah, the curriculum sucks if you don't produce world champions. How about that? Oh, that's, that's what people wa- say? Yeah, that there's not a world champion. Oh. I, that, I mean, that, that I would be a watered down that. thing. I, I don't mean. Huh. There's a lot of, you know. Most schools. Every school. Yeah. You know, most, that, yeah. most schools are watered down. Right. 99% of them. Well, most of the world right. champions. Oh, all of the world champions come from 10 schools. More or less. You know, very rarely does a, a world champion come from not Alliance, uh, Gracie Baja, Checkmat, Atos, AOJ, uh, Dream Art now, which is a break off. You know, there's some break off schools. Dream Art? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a break off of Checkmat, I believe. Oh, really? Zenith. Okay. You know, but you know, uh, so they all come from this, a couple of hubs on the Nogi side, uh, the Donahue guys, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. so no one's really broken through that. Interesting. You know? No one's really broken through the, the, the world, like the adult black belt world champion. Right. So, you know, we'll see. You know? It just seems like you would have a higher likelihood of creating an environment that it will produce a champion. If you can get everyone rowing in the same direction. Right. You know, like if, if the style listic choices, if individual expression of jujitsu is too varied, then it's like you don't have you don't have quite the ironing iron sharpening iron effect. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if you can get everybody on the same high level and let innovation happen on top of that, that seems to be where you're really going to leap into that. And I feel like that's what we are trying to do across all of our, all schools, of our schools is is to create a centralized core curriculum, not something that stagnates. It's something that iterates every couple of years or so because the overall meta Oof. of jujitsu evolves constantly, right? right? Until we fucking film the next no gi intermediate curriculum. I have and the so other much one's that. not that old yet. No, it's two years right? old. Right? Exactly. And I've even dealt with questions from instructors from your no gi curriculum where they're like, Elliot says this. And I say, you know what? I bet he's already changed his mind because oh. I hear him saying this now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> it moves fast. I hate that. No, like Fast. I, I, I don't hate it. Okay. I, w- I won't say I hate that no-gi curriculum. Uh, it's outdated. I've ma- we've made updates. <laughs> you know, we've made updates and I don't think we're a full year through yet. Maybe no, we're through. We've gone through, through okay. one full. It takes a year and a half to get through it. He would know. He's been teaching it since yeah. day one. I'm through one and a half cycles. Okay. I think I'm starting unit 15 or 16. Okay. Next week. So. Right. We all are. 15 yeah. Or, yeah. So yeah. that, you know, but yeah, like, like to where I, I have, we have to film again mm-hmm. because the wrestling, like it, it got updated, you know, it got updated. Uh, I, and, and mostly what gets updated in my opinion is once you see it and I was talking to Alex about this, about, uh, on kids levels, like with kids, the student can fucking do it. The student can do it. Like they, like the per, the human on average, right? You're always going to have someone who is way behind, and you're always going to have someone who excels, right? But on average, if you ask them to do it, they get it done. They get it done. 
you know? Like, because a lot of times you, be, you don't believe that they can do all of this, like, hand fighting. Like, my kids, like, with basketball. Simon with basketball. Oh, and, and Kanan, too. Uh, they play at a level higher than what I played at at high school. Like, what a high school game looked like and what the, the, the athlete was performing on the court. And it's because they can see it on the internet. They see it on the internet. They sit up there. They watch YouTube all fucking day. Like, well, not all, no, sorry, hold on, that'd be bad parenting. When they go to bed, <laughs> you know, when they go to bed, they watch you. Simon literally just watches Kobe Bryant on YouTube Shorts, and then he sees what's possible, and then he goes and tries it. So they, but that's the same with our athletes. So mm-hmm. I think that is where the updating comes from, and we learn how to teach it better, and then we go, okay, it's got to be updated. Right. So, but the the curriculum is amazing. I would say, mm-hmm. um, because. It, it got us on all on the same page with no gi, mm-hmm. right? It, it's and I don't think anybody else has ever put out a no gi curriculum ever. It makes skillful students too. You know, mm-hmm. oh, the yeah. people who have been coming to my no gi classes since we started it are so much more skillful, and it happens relatively quickly, right? It happens in three months. <clears throat> you see them doing things that were like so foreign to them that they were they were white belt and blue belts were just having white belt moments learning these techniques and now they're hitting it in training they're hitting it in competitions they look so smooth when we're drilling in class and it's just like it builds skillful students uh it was it was really cool when the east online people when our current clients came and they watched uh my nogi intermediate class they were like how the fuck do they move this well mm-hmm. and it's not me right it's not me the teacher it's the system it's the system right. of how to teach a class, how to teach the class, how to put the moves together. Uh, and I, I know we're going to blow your minds right now. They don't train live. They rarely train live in intermediate class, positionally train live, but there's almost never shake hands and go right in any of our intermediate classes. You guys might have some, can, can, you do? No, oh, FIPS. Okay. What are you FIPS. Talking about? Well, my class is an hour and a half long. So we do technique for 45 minutes we do positional for 15 and then we do 30 minutes of training so, because there's small because who are you allow in the class two oh, stripes and up. yeah yes. two stripes and yes up, right yes. okay but for when you have a more full advanced only program mm-hmm. with an intermediate only program the 15 minutes of, of positional is you have an hour it's over oh right right it's over so look, this is an example of the differences between academies. Yeah. You know, like you it's guys. It's scale. It's scale. It's scale. It's scale. Yeah. You, you combine, like, I mean, you know, going back to how we started with our meetings and Phipps, you probably remember this. I think when we, like, I think Longmont, because it was the newest school, was one of the first schools to just start using traction, which is called Bloom now. Right. Right. And we had one meeting. Like we just set up one meeting and in the software. And you were the, the DH other than Phipps. Of right, yeah. I mean, were, it, it was yeah. like me, Phipps, and then there was like a couple other instructors. I mean, it was like, and I'm talking after we reopened from COVID. Right, right. You know, like we had more staff before we had to close down for three months. But right. then when we came back at 50% of what we used to have, like it was a small crew and we had to work our way back up. I mean, there was no front desk staff when we opened back right. up, you know. Um and it was just one meeting because there were no departments or whatever. So we just had one meeting a week to to deal with all these things. Um, forgot where I was going with the scale. scale, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, scale. And you'll you'll as your school grows and you have to you know make the departments more granular. Like the GM is wearing all the hats, then it grows, and then you figure out what's taking up most of your bandwidth. More often than not, it's your kids' program. Because for every kid student, you have two parents, and then that's three people. So when that program grows, it's it's an exponential effect of like what's going on there let's, with events and all that stuff. Let's focus our next podcast all on the departments. Oh yeah, and how, how it we, structures, and how we yeah, structure totally. the department. So so we know what we're going to do in the next podcast. Let's end it right. I think it's been okay. a great yeah, sure. a great go right. Um, a great first go for us. Obviously, we'll improve. Mm-hmm. We'll get another microphone. Um, <laughs> my egg shit. Another the, camera. You know yeah. another camera my egg shit on the on the foam on the ceiling so the echo yeah. will be better so we're, we're gonna fix that but this is how the podcast is gonna roll for a while um look our website easton.online is up and running it and it is very specific about our offers um if you are interested in any of this uh 
any whatsoever, go there. We have some freebies on the website, mm-hmm. and we also have this intro pack, right? Um, I met with our guy. He's going to change the name of that, by the way. He says terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs> so uh, we're learning and growing. Yeah, we. Yeah, it's okay. I was like, uh, yeah, no, we suck. Whatever. <laughs> you know, like this isn't. We we teach martial arts. That's yeah. what we do, you know? So uh, he's going to change the name of it. Um, but there is a starter intro pack with 10 videos on there, right? Uh, maybe the 10 most important lessons that we have for you guys. It's 99 bucks, right? There's probably, you know, God, there's an easy $1,000 worth of information on that, on sure. all of that, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but go get it. Go grab it. If, if you are interested in any of this, reach out to us. Uh, you're not on the internet anymore. Are you on the internet, Phipps? <laughs> Where are you? D ferocious underscore Mike P at Instagram. D or the? The. T H E. T H E. The ferocious underscore Mike P on Instagram. I'm Fire Marshall 205. We are Easton dot online. So anywhere you want to go, hit us up. Don't try to talk to Jordan. <laughs> um, and we will we'll, we'll try to point you in the right direction, even if it's just a question. Right, even if it's just a question, we're we're down to answer. So um, we're glad to be back. Uh, the next podcast is going to be with Mike and Ian, uh, and then we'll be back. We're going to talk about departments. So it's going to be us focused. If you have a question that you want to hear us discuss, hit us up as well. We'll discuss it on, on the podcast. So uh, that's it, fellas. Good podcast. Let's go, everyone. Have a great day.